gone to undergraduate school and I started um, in the uh, basement of the old library, which was in the, I believe is Ezekiel Cullen building. It was before the law school building and the location uh, that you're at now. Uh, actually, after that, we moved into a liberal arts building. Uh, uh, we were sharing that. And then finally we got the late location where the school is. and. Um, and so I had my very first semester, I guess in 78, in the fall of 78, I was a, what they called a pre-law student. They would let you into law school after 90 hours. And then when you finished 30 hours in law school, you would get your undergraduate degree. Mine was in business administration. And um, so 78 was a, pretty big year. Uh, Kennedy, Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Um, uh, Reverend Martin Luther King was assassinated uh, in 68. There was a, uh, it was an election year. The Vietnam War uh, was going on. Um, um, there was uh, the civil rights, major civil rights bills had been passed in 1964 and 65. And while I was a student uh, in undergraduate, there had been a lot of uh, student um, activity, protesters and stuff like that, both uh, uh, civil rights and the war and freedom of expression and things like that. It was kind of a hotbed. They, for a while there, they, they, uh, uh, the, the Houston had kind of a, a reputation of, uh, uh, of being a pretty liberal school, uh, you know, a little bit about the history of Texas. We're not known for being a very liberal, but Houston was looked upon as a uh, as an area where there was a, 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 a good diversity of students and uh, divergent views. And we had a lot of uh, students that worked downtown at the office buildings and the energy companies. And so it was a, it was a wonderful mixture of um, of people with diverse backgrounds and interests and. Um, it was a it was a great place to be, and so that was in uh, coming up to seventy eight, and then uh, seventy nine, I believe, is when the draft they, they they had the big lottery for the draft, and so uh, a lot of the students were uh, waiting to see whether their birthday would be the first to go or not, and uh, that affected a lot of the students. Um, uh, when I was in undergraduate, a lot of the kids were in ROTC and. Uh, they got uh, deferments until they finished their ROTC program and then went into the military and went to Vietnam. So there, there was a lot of things going on. I think the major difference, uh, while all these things were going on, um, uh, and the Tet Offensive started in Vietnam and I think around six, late 68 or 69. Uh, so the attitude about Vietnam was changing. But in the law school, the, the huge difference was in law school, is that um, the, the, the students seem to be so focused. Um, my colleagues seem to be so focused on getting their law degree and, and, uh, <laughs> and trying to figure out law school and how to study and you know, getting ready for one exam at the end of the year and that kind of thing that um, uh, is some of that, some of those activities in undergraduate school kind of took a back seat. <laughs> And so you had a very uh, kind of a sober, serious uh, quest uh, to um, complete your studies, pass, and then be able to go out and make some money <laughs> and participate in the profession. Right. So would you say that what was going on in society, did that impact your learning as a law student? Or do you think you were more focused on, on your goals? I think, I think probably undergraduate school probably had more of an impact in that I was younger. I was from a small, fairly, relatively small uh, uh, area, uh, had a little uh, uh, urban to it, but mostly country. And I, my background was farming and ranching and agriculture, uh, um, citrus, uh, uh, trade with Mexico. At, on, I lived near the border uh, and I came from an old kind of a 
uh, family on my mother's side. I was kind of old land grant type and on my father's side, recent immigrant from Mexico. Uh, and so um, coming to Houston was uh, an eye opening experience. <laughs> and uh, I was just exposed to so many ideas and um, uh, uh, my mother was very liberal with me in terms of uh, uh, let me go out and, and uh, do what I wanted to do and participate in sports and whatever, but, but we're a very traditional family and uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very, very close family structure. And uh, you may differ uh, with your parents or your uh, elders, uh, but uh, you didn't necessarily uh, uh, announce those differences when you were uh, growing up in that society. So Houston was different. Things were going on. People were complaining. You had different views. I, you get exposed to different cultures. I remember uh, in law school, I was the uh, uh, only non-Black on a Black semi-pro baseball team. Uh, and and uh, it, it just exposed me to different worlds. So did the culture there, um, yeah, it, it changed me, but probably most of those changes came as I adapted to and accepted uh, and saw uh, different people with different uh, points of view. And um, I'm a pretty good listener. Uh, I talk too much, but I do listen. And so I was able to um, uh, kind of like a smorgasbord, you know, where you go and you get to choose from a lot of foods. Uh, I was exposed to a whole lot of different people with different ideas and backgrounds. And it gave me the chance to find that uh, uh, there were some things that uh, that I really didn't understand and hadn't been exposed to. And I could say, ooh, I kind of like that part of the table. I'm gonna take that dish. And from this culture over here, or this way of thinking, I could say, well, I kind of like that dish over there. So I'll put some of that on my platter. And uh, uh, so to that extent, yes, I was affected uh, by the great diversity and job opportunities and a number of people and uh, 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 that were in the big cities. It was eye-opening to me, yeah. I always wanted to go to law school. I knew I wanted to be law school. When, when I was about in sixth grade, there was a politician that ran for, had been in uh, the state senate and he was, my uncle was a preacher and he was kind of a, after my grandfather died, he was kind of the head of the family. And uh, he had a pretty big following. And, um, and so uh, there was this man uh, who was, I think he was, uh, had, uh, I know he had been in the Texas Senate and then he, was, he ran for district attorney and won that race. And he used to come out and ask my uncle to support him. And um, he had this, majestic voice. Uh, he just, it, I, it's just a pleasure to listen to him. He's, he had a deep authoritarian round tones and uh, was very polite and very gracious and very kind to my mother. And she would fix a meal and he would come over. And when it was through, he'd put his arms around her and tell her how wonderful her food was. So like everybody in the whole family was like struck with uh, you know, here's a pretty important man and he's so kind and he's so nice and he's so polite. And uh, that probably influenced me more than anything. And I said, well, you know, I wanna be like Jim, you know? And so I thought, uh, he's a lawyer, that's, that's what I'll do. And then, it, you know, just, I never diverted. I've always, I've always wanted to be a lawyer and I've always been a Dodger fan, so. Well, uh, then uh, I, I dated a girl for a little while, and then uh, she had a sister that was in undergraduate school uh, at Houston. And so I got, I was interested, and I had a brother uh, in California at UCLA at, uh, that was in an acting school. Um, I can't think of the uh, name, uh, name of a very famous acting school. And, and I was very close to him, so I... Um, uh, I was interested in Houston and I, and I got accepted at UCLA and the several Eastern schools and UT and, but I somehow or other this thing about 
Houston, and maybe if maybe uh, I thought if I went to Houston, I'd get a chance to spend a little time with this girl. Well, ultimately, she didn't go to Houston, and I did. So uh, <laughs> on registration there, I was looking around, hoping she'd be there. But she wasn't there, and but I was. And I, in the meantime, I had made some friends in Houston through uh, some older uh, students who were in college uh, that had friends in Houston. And I started learning more about it. And I realized that I could go to school there and I could get a part-time job because my family would help me, my uncle uh, would help me. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, you know I, could, I could survive, but I wasn't gonna be able to, you know, have any nice uh, meals to go out and eat meals or anything like that. Uh, so if anything, if I was going to have any kind of life outside of just uh, uh, a desk and the books, I was gonna to have to go out and work. So Houston afforded me an opportunity to go to school. It was, uh, there was jobs. If you wanted to work in Houston, then you could work. And so I always had little, little jobs while I was in school. And so that's it kind of worked into interest finding out about Houston, finding out it was a good place to go, finding out it, it, uh, it uh, uh, could fulfill my needs while I went to school. And that's how I wound up in Houston. And then I found out about the law school and uh, there were, we had some uh, people in my undergraduate school that went to Houston and became pretty famous as uh, John O'Quinn. And I was a couple of years older than me and I knew him. And there was a guy that was president of the student body named uh, Jim Evans, who was also a lawyer and went to UH. And some of my uh, friends from undergraduate that were older uh, were, uh, uh, were at the law school and they kind of piqued my interest in staying in Houston. And plus I could always find a part-time job. And, right. and I knew that. And so uh, it, it turned out just great. I mean, that, you know, I hadn't seen that girl in a, since high school days, but uh, it turned out to be a kind of a blessing to wind up in Houston. <laughs> That's great to hear. So can you tell me more about your law school experience? What um, stood out to you about your time at the Law Center? Well, like I said, I was surrounded by people that were pretty focused. Uh, it was very competitive. Uh, I didn't know how competitive it was. I, uh, I was f fortunate enough to have gone to a very good um, parochial school, a little Catholic school for the first eight years. And so uh, had these nuns, the Sisters of the Holy Cross that were from Indiana. And um, they were wonderful teachers. And so I had really a really good um, background. My first eight years, I didn't have problems in high school. I didn't have problems in, in undergraduate school except for my economics class. I don't know, I, I just I had a little problems with that. I had to take that. I dropped that course, took it back, took, picked it up later on and did okay. But uh, other than that, I did quite well. And then I got to law school and I realized that um, uh, I wasn't going to be able to skim something one time and and I'd know it all that I, that I had to, uh, you know, uh, not just remember that two and two plus is four, but that two and two is four. And from over here, I got to pick something else up and add that to the equation and subtract that from this theory or this uh, exception and whatever it was, it, it, was um, it was a little more complicated. And then my colleagues were all very, very focused. And, uh, and that whole atmosphere was, uh, there was an atmosphere of competition, but there was also, you know, if you wanted to do well, uh, or if you wanted to get a command of um, uh, of your uh, subject matter, uh, you had to pay a lot more attention to detail. And um, so I, I think that was uh, the big difference. Uh, the difference was focus. Several of them were just fantastic. I remember. Uh, a gentleman named Cox that I had for uh, um, um, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it's a property class, and then uh, John Mixon for real estate and land development. There was a there was an exceptional professor named Newell Blakely, 
uh, who had been a dean there during at one time U of H was had a lot of different deans for a very short period of time. And Newell's specialty was criminal law and criminal procedure, uh, I think common law. Uh, and he was an exceptional uh, teacher. And he was, uh, I didn't get my best grades from Newell Blakely, but I felt that I learned more uh, and retained more. Uh, uh, and uh, there was a lot of pressure and he would uh, call on you in class. And, and uh, you know, it was kind of an honor if he kept, kept you up on your feet for a long time, that probably meant you were answering the questions right. Uh, but you know, he would promptly dispatch you if, uh, if you weren't prepared or you, you didn't help him teach the class with your colloquy with him. Uh, he, was, he just had a wonderful technique and he liked the students. He seemed cold but he wasn't and I got to have him for several classes and he wrote a book uh, on evidence that when I went back in to practice it was the first book that I purchased uh, as uh, I, I got Newell Blakely's book on evidence and then he revised it and then when I became a court of appeals judge later on uh, it was the book that I insisted that they buy from my office uh, and then uh, later on when I got on the federal bench and I, I, uh, I bought a couple of copies and kept them in my library for my law clerks with the admonition that if they wanted to get a good background into a rule of evidence, that the, maybe they ought to go read what Newell Blakely had to say about it and uh, they would understand it afterwards. Now, you know, maybe a different jurisdiction might make a different exception or might not ex accept a part or it was a little different than under Texas law. Uh, but um, uh, Newell Blakely's, uh, Newell's Blakely's book on evidence uh, uh, was the best start uh, if you had a problem with some evidentiary rule. And he was a wonderful, wonderful professor. He was available. And I found out rather than being a cold person, uh, uh, the more time you spent uh, to him, with him, that uh, he would have, oh, it was such a big thing if he'd invite you across the street over to Miss Graces and have a have a beer with him after class uh, late in the afternoon. Sometimes, but, you know, he was kind of so upright and so proper. And here he was uh, drinking a beer with you. And he thought, "Wow, you know, I'm in, I'm in the clouds. I'm I'm having a beer with Noah Blakely." <laughs> he he just had a huge impression. Made a huge impression. Uh, I I was going to stay in Houston. I had several job offers. In fact, I nearly, well, I didn't. I, I, I turned it down. I, my, after my first year in law school, I had some recruiters from Yale and Harvard that came down and they were looking for a minority, specifically looking for blacks and his, especially Hispanics and Indian, uh, Native Indian uh, students. To, and uh, I think they'd offered me, as Yale did, uh, you know, I, I could go to Yale, but I'd have to give up my, my a whole year and start again. And uh, of course, you know, <laughs> I, I, I couldn't afford to give up a year. I wanted to finish up and go back and, or stay in Houston and make some money. I really wanted to stay in Houston, but my family uh, was having some health issues. My uncle was ill. My mom was very ill. And um, and I was on a plane after taking my bar exam. I had pretty much decided to stay in Houston. I had some offers. And um, there was a young lady on the plane that I had gone to school with and her father was a partner in a law firm in McAllen. Uh, and uh, I told her I, uh, I was taking the bar. I had just finished the bar. And, and out of the blue, uh, her dad's partner called me and said, he. I heard that I was just taking the bar and wanted to find out if I wanted to go back home. And um, uh, it, 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 be, I'm not even going to mention how, how little the pay was back then. <laughs> it shocked you. Uh, uh, but, you know, it gave me a chance to go back home. And I started thinking about it. And my parents, uh, my uncle and my mom needed some help. And, um, and I had natural clients. I grew up there. On my mother's side, we'd been there for you know a couple hundred years, and uh, my father was a, 
uh, uh, was uh, 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 worked in the hotels and was very well uh, known uh, and, uh, and, and a like person. Uh, uh, he's a very humble and modest man, but he was very, very well liked. And so I kind of had a natural client base there. And so I wound up going to McAllen and then uh, try, and trying to get this, not spend too much time with each phase. But then uh, I, became, uh, I rose up pretty fast in the profession and did mostly trial work of all kinds. We went all over the state and tried trespass to try titles and will contests, election contests and tort cases. I represented the school district. I represented the city of McAllen. One of my part, uh, one of the partners was 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 the attorney for the city, and so I, uh, as a, as a firm member, I got assigned a lot of uh, work that he that he was in charge of for the city, uh, and and I worked with some banks, insurance companies, and I was just seemed like we were in trial all the time. We were in trial or trying to get out of trial, <laughs> and uh, and very shortly. Not too long after I was down in the valley, I, uh, I left that firm and started a firm with a friend of mine and, I, and they elected me president of the Bar Association. So um, uh, county judge, uh, after that, I'm gonna skip out some periods of time. The um, county judge, was, they had created a new county court at law and he wasn't, the county judge wasn't too crazy about uh, appointing the, the county court at law. Uh, he had two or three people or three or four people that he was in, uh, that had in, expressed an interest, uh, but he wasn't sure he wanted to appoint any of them. And so he, he knew I was a president of the bar and he knew my father and he asked me if I could help him find somebody in the bar uh, that would be acceptable and, um, and respected by the bar uh, that would take it. And, uh, and I said, well, let me do a hunt. So I, I checked with... Uh, all the lawyers that I thought that um, you know would would make a good judge, uh, and I talked to a number of people, but no one really could afford to do it for as little uh, pay as it was involved. So I finally told the county judge that uh, unfortunately I was not able to find him somebody, and uh, so I was walking out of his office, and he said, he said, let me ask you, would you do it? And I said, oh no, I can't afford it. I'm just starting out, you know, I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> no answer short answer no uh and he said well i just want you to think about it he said you don't have to run he says just a, a take it and then the people can decide who they want under the texas law then you uh you have you fill it and then then there's an open uh election at the next general election well the next general election was this spring and this was in the fall uh, so it wouldn't be too long. He says, then people can decide who they want. I don't have to appoint somebody. I don't make anybody mad. Uh, I appoint you. And then if you don't want to run for office, that's fine. Uh, and I said, well, you know, I, <laughs> I just started this law firm with uh, my friend Joseph Snerros and, uh, uh, and a fellow named Brown. Uh, uh, Said, I only could do it. He said, "Well, just don't say no. Just, just think about it for a couple of days." And he says, uh, "I'll take care of you. You know, you won't do it for a little while. I'll take it as a personal favor. And, you know, later on, if you're not uh, don't want to run, I'll, I'll, I'll recommend you, and I'll, I'll see that you get some business." And so uh, then here I am. I've asked the county judge uh, asked me to do him a favor. He's a friend of my dad. I really don't want to do it. I can't afford to do it. So. Uh, I, I, I ultimately, I said, okay, I'll do it just for a little while. And I had no intentions of running. And uh, in the meantime, I kind of liked doing it. And uh, a position came up uh, uh, for a district judgeship. And I became interested in that. And so I decided to stay for another year. I ran, and but with the idea that uh, the election after that, I would run for district judge. And, uh, and that's what happened. So that was in 77. And so with the exception of, uh, with uh, about eight months, 
when I left uh, the county court at law to run for a district judge, uh, I didn't, I didn't want to be on the bench and be running at the same time because it was going to be take too much time. And I, I didn't, I didn't feel like I could get the judge work done. So I ran for office from 1977, I think October the 1st, uh, I had that short period of time of maybe about eight or nine months. And then about a year and a quarter after I lost my court of criminal appeals election, statewide election, before President Clinton appointed me, uh, since 1977, I, it, it, with the exception of that year and a half and that six or eight months, I've been a judge for that whole period of time. So that's wow. a long time. Yeah, that's a long time, especially for a career that you didn't necessarily see. Or oh, no, no I, I didn't. I didn't get out of law school with the idea I was going to be a judge. I, was, I like litigating. I like being in a courtroom. Uh, uh, I talk too much. I mean, uh, you know, and as a judge, uh, when you're on the bench, you know, you, the less you say generally, the better. Uh, uh, and you just need to rule and be authoritative. And um, um, but on a personal level, I, my wife says that, you know, if I pass away, I'll probably be talking for about two hours after I die. So <laughs> I'm just, I'm t my judge role is completely different from my, you know, personal or a role or, you know, when I'm out in, uh, you know, in a, in a non-judicial uh, sure. uh, role on, you know, on the bench. I'm just completely different person on the bench. <laughs> So can you tell me about what you enjoy about being a judge? <clears throat> well, um, at the risk of sounding um, kind of, I don't think that I'm uh, being conceited. Of course, if you're conceited, you don't know. You're so conceited, you don't know you're conceited. But <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 I think I'm pretty decent at it. Um, it's not that I consider myself brilliant or anything like that. I'm a pretty good listener and I'm pretty good at uh, listening to both sides and uh, considering stuff. I'm not a good um, joiner. I'm not a good rah-rah guy for other than maybe the Dodgers. You know, I'm, I, I don't have this uh, feeling that if this is my side, uh, I've got to back them up no matter what. It, you know, I've always had the feeling like, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm root for you, I, whatever, but, you know, if you're wrong, you're wrong, and I can't go along with you. So um, uh, uh, I, th I think as a judge, you, you have to kind of, uh, be able to divorce yourself from a lot of your own personal views. Uh, and oftentimes uh, you have to make rulings that are really inconsistent with the way, uh, what you would do if you were the one that was making the law or uh, if you were the one that had met, set the precedent. Um, and uh, you have to conform to the expectations of the bar that is you know follow the law uh do what the law what you feel the law requires you to do and kind of put put your own little mindset off in a corner and um and I, and i think i can do that and i and i've done that over the years and i'm comfortable with that uh, uh, you know, sometimes that doesn't make it very popular. People think, well, oh, you're a Clinton appointee. You're supposed to be for that, or, or you're this, or, you know, you're Hispanic and you ought to, you have to be this way, or you're, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I think you can be all of those things and, and have certain leanings. But as a judge, uh, you just, uh, you have to be able to put those things aside and, and um, it doesn't bother me uh, to do it. Um, um, and I've been doing it for such a long time now that, you know, and I also never thought, well, if I lose this position, 
or if I lose this election, my life is going to be ruined or anything. I never, I just always kind of felt like, you know, try your try your hardest, do your best, give it your best shot, and then and then go on. You know, that's that's all you can do. And uh, anyway, for whatever reason, I'm comfortable with with my role and feel that feel that I've, I've got some attributes uh, that help me in, help me in that regard. It's kind of funny when I was a court of appeals judge, I missed being on the district bench. When I was on the district bench, I missed being a lawyer litigating. Uh, when I was on the court of criminal appeals, uh, uh, you know, there were certain things about being on the court of appeals that I liked. I did like that job. And I love my job as a, uh, a US Court of Appeals judge is fantastic. Well, I've had great colleagues along the way, but I not only have had great colleagues on the Court of Appeals, uh, a lot of whom I have big disagreements with, but all of whom I have a tremendous amount of respect for, but I also had wonderful staff and uh, uh, law clerks that were just, um, uh, brilliant and helpful and um, uh, it's, uh, it's just a, a fantastic uh, environment for someone like me uh, to um, to help me uh, get to the uh, uh, right answer um, uh, uh, it's, it's um, I guess that's why I've said it I've always I've always thought, well, when I, especially when I was younger, I'll, I'll go back and do this. I love trial. I love this. And over the over time, it's become harder and harder. And I can't imagine uh, uh, doing any, doing anything else. <laughs> uh, so it's just the way it worked out. And you just uh, it's the path that I've chosen, and and I and I've uh, either liked it or have grown to like it even more. <laughs> certainly, I wouldn't be a judge. I would certainly wouldn't be on the Court of Appeals, U.S. Court of Appeals. Um, uh, I have uh, uh, met uh, presidents. I have met uh, the Queen of England and her husband, who's <laughs> now deceased. Uh, um, uh, I've had lunch in the White House. I've had um, met governors. Uh, I've met mayors of cities, and um, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe I would have gotten politics. I doubt it. Uh, I, I don't know. It's my law school career and the training that I've got. Um, have created, um, have, have been the building blocks upon which I was able to to let develop the life that I have. And so I certainly I wouldn't have that without uh, a law degree. But it also helps me, for instance, give my daughter's advice and uh, um, uh, helps me in some personal things when I, you know, kind of, have a little bit of an idea of what my rights are, and and um, and uh, you know sometimes you don't enforce your rights. You don't need to. It's it's, it's too big of a price, and you can kind of give in a little bit. Um, but you know you mellow. It's always there. The, the training is is always there. Uh, and even little things like uh, having your Yard man come up and ask you for advice, in, and uh, and uh, you know you can't practice law as a judge or whatever, but you know you can send them to lawyers or tell, give them some advice. Maybe go see a lawyer or whatever. <clears throat> There's some things you can do without being unethical that um, that helps you uh, and, and allows you to help. Uh, the community and your friends and the people that are around you. Uh, and it, it's just 
it, it, it's such a big role in my life that I, you know, I can't imagine what I'd be like without my law degree. Um, it, uh, I, I guess I, maybe I owe it to that silver haired man with a nice voice that used to come to visit me when uh, I was a little boy and used to come to visit my uncle, uh, you know, uh, and got me on this path. Uh, you know, but for him, maybe I wouldn't, I wouldn't be in the law business. And, and, but, you know, but for that girl, maybe I wouldn't have gone to Houston, but for Houston, maybe I wouldn't have gone to, you know, who knows? Uh, I'm just there and I'm enjoying it and I'm grateful. Well, uh, I'm just really proud of U of H. Uh, I remember starting out in that basement uh, uh, with very few students um, uh, moving over in, in uh, another building that wasn't dedicated to the law school until the building was finished. Uh, I've seen the law school uh, garner great honors, uh, great debate teams, uh, great programs in medicine and insurance and uh, real estate and and just uh, you know go into the uh, top tier of uh, of law schools and uh, you know I'm just really really proud of the accomplishments of um, the University of Houston and its faculty uh, and I'm real uh, I'm grateful uh, that they were there for me and I'm impressed. Uh, with what they're doing for uh, the legal community and for the Houston community and for the state of Texas and for the uh, legal profession. And uh, so uh, I have great hopes. I was a big advocate at one time. Um, uh, there was a lot, there had a, what we call the night school, you know, uh, which, uh, you know, were some of the people worked uh, that were engineers at Shell and some of the energy companies and insurance companies and title companies. Uh, their students, their employees would go and take a night course in there. And, uh, and one time they were thinking about shutting that down and being more like uh, the schools that are just full-time type of students. And, uh, and I'm so glad that uh, University of Houston decided to uh, keep its doors open and allow a, a program that is now fantastic. So, he, you know, uh, I took so, a couple of nights cl classes while I was at U of H and sure enough, uh, here were people that had gone to engineering school at Rice University and, and Stanford and some other places that were working in Houston and gosh, they were smart people. And, uh, some of them were married and had two or three kids and uh, had important jobs. And here they were spending their free time getting a law degree. And, uh, and I, I was sold on the idea of, my goodness, if we can get really, really smart, dedicated people like this in the law school, uh, we don't need to make it just only for kids that can afford to go full time. And so I'm really proud of the university. I'm proud that they're uh, continuing with a program uh, that allows students to take a little more time and, and work and, um, and still get uh, a law degree and, and with a longevity that we now have in our culture and our society, you know, uh, you know, it's just more people trained in the law to, that even if they don't go into law, they're their legal background is helping them in their work and it's, it's helping the community and, and our society. So I'm extraordinarily proud of U of H because it's, um, it's serving the, the community in, in, in ways that uh, a lot of other law schools that have big names don't serve the community. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm real happy and I'm real proud to be a graduate of U of H. 
to the University of Houston as you celebrate your 75th anniversary. Uh, I wish you, first of all, I thank you. Uh, I thank you for what you've done for me, what you've done for the legal community, what you've done for the city of Houston and the state of Texas, um, and for uh, the students that have gone uh, to school there uh, and have excelled and have, are serving their communities. I thank you for being there for me and for being for, there for us and for being there for the state of Texas and for the, for the city of Houston. And I wish you a great birthday and have a lot more good and successful birthdays. God bless.